I'd like to welcome you to our place here. Um, I'm delighted to host this lecture. And um, I would also like to mention that for architects in the group, there is continuing education credit for this lecture. So there is a sign up sheet here, which we'll put on the counter here. And if you'd like to sign up at the end, then you will get credit for this. Um, even better. Um, Thank you all for coming tonight. As Brian said, I'm Mary Roberts. I'm the Executive Director for the Market House Restoration Corporation. We're so pleased to be here tonight for the first in our lecture series, right at the start. Um, it's wonderful to be at UB. UB is a strong partner with the Market House. For those of you that aren't aware of it, they're the ones who actually donated the house to the restoration project. So UB has been part of this project from the very beginning. Brian serves on the board of directors for the Market House Restoration Corporation. Jack Quinnen is here tonight to the curator and senior curator for the Market House. has been involved in the project from the very beginning and very exception. We're so pleased to be here this evening, partnering once again with UB and we hope the partnership will be working for many years. Um, we have with us tonight one of the preeminent scholars on Frank Lloyd Wright in America. Robert McCarter is a noted Wright scholar and a prolific author. He, in fact, is one of the few practicing architects he also writes about architecture, and that's a unique distinction. He is the Ruth and Norma Moore Professor of Architecture at the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Planning at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. We're so pleased to be here tonight to lead off the lecture. He is a prolific writer on writing in particular. In 1997, he wrote a scholarly and richly detailed um, account of Wright's life and work aptly titled Frank Lloyd Wright in 2005. He continued on the writing by way on and by right, which is a primer of architectural principles. And most recently, in 2006, part of the critical life series he wrote by Adam Bain, and he's a wonderful talent about his life and his work. And uh, we actually had that for sale this evening after the lecture. For those of you that would like to purchase a copy, you can cover the city after the lecture is signed up, too. Um, as Brian said, this is an AIA credit lecture. There are members here and didn't sign in for these two, so at the end. Without further ado, I would like you to join me in welcoming Robert Carter. Plans, 
from the work of early moderns. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, and every plan, I would argue, every plan made today employs one or more of these three ways of making, whether consciously or not. Uh, today, the most well-known of these <coughs> plan types is the uh, Le Corbusier's Plan Libre, or the Free Plan, uh, conceived in the early 1920s. Uh, and this involves a flat slab floor, as you can see in the diagram on the right, and flat slab ceiling supported by a grid of, in this case, preferably cylindrical columns, so that the space separating walls may be given any form, allowing for Le Corbusier's uh, what Le, Le Corbusier called the marriage of contours. Uh, a discovery he made in his morning work, which was purist paintings, um, so that what is inside may be um, by movement through the space in the promenade architecturale become the outside for yet another inside. So then those uh, motives are then joined by the other four of the Corbusier's famous five points. The others would be the free facade, which comes from the free plan, of the windows alongier, the strip windows, the building raised on pilotis, and the roof garden that you have in uh, recompense for that. Ten years earlier than that, around 1910, the Austrian architect Adolf Bloss proposed a well-known, uh, a less well-known, I would say, but perhaps in my mind, anyway, more radical plan type, which he called a round plan. And round is German for perhaps place or room, so this could be called a room plan. And Adolf Loos proposed a fundamentally free section where each room is its own center, assuming a position with respect to adjacent rooms, uh, based on the social relationships and functions of those rooms. For instance, the dining rooms are almost invariably one meter or three feet above the living room. Each room had a position in a section and plan and a set of proportions that is height to width to length that were appropriate to its particular function and the associated position in the entry sequence and views and openings to related rooms. Like Le Corbusier, uh, Loos tended to collect his rooms, uh, his round plan rooms, into a rectilinear enclosure, so the cubic. Uh, so that like the free plan, the round plan came as a surprise for those who entered the house. Ten years before that, around 1900, Michael Lloyd Wright proposed the first prairie houses. And I would argue that what they have, uh, I have called on the woven plan. It's a plan conceived as a weaving. Almost the opposite of the Corbusier's free plan, though sharing some traits with the closest round plan, Wright's woven plan formed interior rooms or volumes using from primarily floors and ceilings, which were often working at cross purposes to each other, um, with minimal walls and little repetitive structure. Fused, all of this fused into a kind of weaving, its edges often open or interlocking with the adjacent spaces. Spaces that are centered on the intersections of two or more spaces, at once introverted and extroverted. Jay Appleton has described the kind of spaces that we comfortable in the landscape as combining prospect and refuge. And this is exactly, I would say, describing how uh, Frank Wright Wright's prairie houses work. Wright was at the beginning of this evolution of modern plan types, and his woven plan originated in the prairie houses. Before going on to look more closely at the prairie houses and the way they serve as origins for Wright's three primary ordering principles in his own work, it is worth taking a moment to examine what the three modern plan types that is, Wright's Woven Plan of 1900, Loos's Round Plan of 1910, and Le Corbusier's Plan Libre of 1920 or thereafter share in common. First is the fact that all three were developed at least in part in reaction to the predominant mode of plan making of the time, the axial planning of the Ecole Beaux-Arts in Paris, uh, the famous design school. Rooms that is that are arranged along symmetrical axes and cross axes in such a way that they're that we, as we look literally in the front door, we can see through from the entry all the way to the goal or destination, and therefore the root of the eye and the root of the body were exactly the same. Yet as all three architects made abundantly clear in both their statements and designs, axial planning and symmetry did not belong 
to any particular style or period. They were part of the common inheritance of mankind. The earliest works of Wright, Most, and Le Corbusier invariably present us with a symmetrical front facade of the house, often with a central entry. But there are, there I would say, any similarities with the Ecole de Beaux Arts planning ends, for all three architects separate the eye and the central axis from the path of the body immediately upon entry. Le Corbusier develops a promenade architectural, which I think Jack will talk further about in his lecture, that moves diagonally in plan and section back and forth across the central axis with the final destination often reconfiguring the entire volume of the house as the back of the villa at Garsh. Um, Lowe's round plan involves a complex series of stepping floors, stairs, and generally spiraling ascension um, through the house um, to the destination space, where the central axis is often again found, but now reoriented by the room's internal relations. And then finally, or rather firstly, I would say, would be Wright's woven plan, which I will spend the rest of this evening on. Uh, I think it can be described as dynamic and static, as prospect and refuge, as having elements of both freedom and order. Wright's very period plans are an achievement that have rarely, if ever, been matched, much less surpassed. And his mastery of the plan bears a study, particularly in this time, our time, of what a friend of mine has called disturbed plans, of plans that ignore our experience, our scale, our gait, our patterns of entering and leaving staying, particularly the rituals of daily life which architecture, according to Wright, should dignify by providing us with use and comfort, by being the, quote, background or framework in which life may take place. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce what I believe are the three sort of common fundamental ordering principles uh, that Wright used throughout his career. And I'm going to introduce them to some degree in the order which I think they became important. Um, and I will uh, often introduce them using houses that we would think of later houses as sort of the preeminent examples of that. But I want to show how the prairie period is when these ideas first evolved. Um, the first has to do with interior space, and I call it folded space down the place. And I use a quote from the physicist A.S. Eddington of 1928. Space is boundless by reentrant form, not by great extension. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright's own house in Oak Park, 1889, which we're looking at here, based on the typical Chicago home builder's so called four square plan, four primary rooms in a square plan. The Wright's own house, of course, has been convincingly shown by Papinel and others um, to be the origin of all his prairie houses as the theme for variation, which the other houses. Ball. The first ordering principle at work in Wright's designs, and I would also argue perhaps most important, has to do with methods for conceiving and making architectural space. And how these ideas about architectural space derived first from his designs for interior space. And how he came to see all architecture as originating in what he later called the space within. All of Wright's primary spatial concepts for which he is today most famous were first given form in interior spaces, bound up with our own experience, and only later were they given exterior form. Now to start with the house, it's clearly a perfect house. Um, the Blossom House of Chicago of uh, 1892, which I would argue is, is before the sort of emergence of the full idea of a prairie house. Perhaps uh, Wright's first use of the square and cruciform plan, which uh, would become one of his uh, favorites, both perfected 14 years later, arguably in Unity Temple, we can um, see in the interior photograph on the right, Wright's first use of a re-entrant corner, uh, a folding of the corner as it reaches the corner so that it comes back out to make a, an outward directed corner so that it both goes in and then comes back out again. As an important point to note here um, is that this spatial evolution, which is occurring inside a building with a classically oriented facade, likely based on a design by the chemical White, complete with Sirliano windows. So in the end, there's sort of magic going on inside, but the box is still uh, reading in a kind of normative language. Now, if that isn't surprising enough, right next door is the MacArthur House, which most people would not be able to pick out of a lineup as a Frank Lloyd Wright House. Also, of 1892, another who played the um, works he did in the last year, he was at Sullivan's office. Um, as if to emphasize the schism between interior space and exterior form, uh, there's the surprising design of the McCarthy.
MacArthur House, the floor plan of the construction documents, uh, which I have here, I realize it's a bit hard to read, but what we have in this plan is the living room and a dining room, which are separated only by a freestanding fireplace with passage from the living to the dining room down both sides. Basically, we have here the Roby House plan 15 years before the fact, but housed in this lovely barn-like chassis. <laughs> In working out this system of spatial order, right, employed a number of ways of weaving and folding spaces together, and the result was spaces that were more precisely defined even as they were overlapped and penetrated to form a more integrated whole. And among those devices were the beams um, here in the here local apartment house, and the stairs uh, also in the Franklin Wright house and down in the brick house. And the way that those sort of spatial the sort of laminations of layers of ceilings to suggest movement uh, in different directions occurring in the same space. In the other case, literally our body physically engaging these stairs, which are a kind of uh, pivot point that locks the second and the first floor together. With right, even an emphasis on the overall horizontality, which he's more famous for, of the house uh, never precludes a vertical or double height space. In fact, they are far more numerous in all his houses throughout his career than generally recognized, and I just show here the Stewart House, the Boynton House, and of course your, your local Davidson House, which I had the pleasure of visiting today. Though I, I didn't take this photograph today, I have to say. Um, there's a sort of fire instrument there that I don't want to talk about. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is go through a series of houses. I'm often not going to show you an exterior photograph at all, because again, my argument in this particular case in the prairie houses and in later work is uh, the priority of the interior space, what Wright called the space within. Uh, the Dana House in Springfield of 1901-02 is in addition to a pre-existing house. It's sort of a house wrapped around a very small earlier house with only one room left to be found in the plan. Um, it's an example of what we call enfilade planning. That is, you move not in corridors, but from one room to another room, often along the edge of that room. Um, and with, in this case, also double height spaces that connect, like the dining room and the living, uh, the entry space, um, that connect two floors as well. So you have connections going between rooms by moving physically from one room to another. Um, uh, as Robin Evans has noted in a very famous essay, this type of planning, this enfilade planning, encourages social and familial interactions as opposed to the avoidance of the same uh, the avoidance of meetings uh, of, with others that the corridor plan was in fact invented to allow. And these meetings with others, whether they are family members or, or strangers, is exactly the unplanned meetings that Kahn talks about as being the most important task of architecture. Um, in the Dana House, the line is blurred between the architectural trim, the beams, the posts, the furniture built in, furniture, uh, freestanding furniture, employing the same elements at all different sorts of nested scales. Drapes, uh, typical in Wright's houses, and also in the Martin house here, um, allow visual privacy. They stop drafts, which also, at the same time, they allow acoustical connection. Hearing, as John Dewey has noted a long time ago, is the more intimate sense as opposed to vision, which is the cooler, more distant sense. The Willits House in Highland Park, Illinois of 1901-02 uses the pinwheel plan. There were two plans proposed for the Ladies' Home Journal, and the second one is the one that the Martin House uses. The pinwheel plan um, of the Ladies' Home Journal 1901 house, which has the very clever title, A Small House with, quote, lots of room in it, end quote. So, so client demands are never different. Um, and this, and this encourages, of course, a spiraling movement around a central fireplace. And um, uh, I think uh, what I will do is walk you through this house, which is in pretty good shape, with the exception of a good bit of the furnishings. And uh, as you know, you approach the house, and there is no uh, quarter given on the front facade as to exactly how you're supposed to attack this beast. And uh, in fact, you have to go find yourself in a little sort of uh, dark area on the right come under and pass through a number of uh, 
of gates in order to achieve just this first view on the lower right as you come in the entry area and then move up in the living room. But, but the technique that's developed here is one that's used consistently throughout his work of this period, especially in these uh, pinwheel plans, which is the fact that I can see through that set of wooden posts, I see where I'm going, which is the living room that's directly ahead, but I physically cannot go there. I must do what I have done here in this slide and turn to the left and move into the edge of the living room. And then, of course, you come into the edge, which produces these diagonal views. And um, this is a historic photograph, and that's a more contemporary one. I'm going to keep the plans up there when I'm looking at these houses, just so you can sort of track your movement through, if you wish. Then again, looking through another screen from the living room, you come into this passage and into the dining room, which uh, again can be seen through the screen but can only be approached uh, by physically turning yet another set of two turns. So the path of the eye and the path of the body. What's up? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I know. You want me to use a pointer? Because it's a disembodied sort of. Uh, uh, problem I have with that. But uh, um, the path of the eye and the path of the body are separated, which is good uh, when you're walking, but I'm not so sure it's good in a lecture, so that's one of the reasons I have a problem with a laser pointer. But, um, and you always move along the edge of the room, which, which sets up a series of, of experience diagonals, I would call them. Not, not literal diagonals, but, but we always uh, sort of strafe the, the room with our views. Um, and just to follow on through with the Willits House, we go up this extremely complicated stair and the other thing that's of interest here is the is the uh, way in which even the section starts getting parsed up so that you know you're there's a room that clearly is halfway up the stairs that has its own ceiling height and yet somehow there's a beam that tells us that we have just passed the threshold of the first floor and gone into the space of the second floor which runs right across the space another one of the low flying beams and then the um, one of the two bedrooms above uh, with this rather spectacular built-in bed, which of course is in the middle of the room. Once again, I cannot physically occupy the middle except perhaps uh, during the evening when I'm least aware of it, but I perambulate around the edges and all of the edges of the room thus become useful um, as storage and light sources and other things, including the head of the bed, which does not quite touch the windows. And then there's this house that no one around here knows anything about, but um, I just want to mention some things uh, with respect to this while we look at some slides. Um, idealized site plan, which was of course drawn up for the Vosmuth, where he tidied up the site, which is a very misshapen thing, and he made it nice and square, and he put it, in my view, on the warp and woof of the spatial loom that Wright uses to structure space. And he, in this case, structures the entire site using this so that it's all squared up and working uh, as it should. Um, even the planting, such as the floor cycle, which was first proposed at the Willits House, as far as I know, um, but I don't believe ever built there, um, is designed to benefit the views from inside the house, which is something that not everyone has recognized. But, but this was not intended as some kind of protective screen for the house, but in fact was totally choreographed to the view that you would have out from within the house or the terrace. Um, and. Uh, I have argued in other places that this is perhaps the most fully woven plan Wright ever built, um, st structured spatially and structurally by the peer clusters, the peer clusters being the key element that he uh, didn't really avail himself of in too many other plans. The plans which are cut, uh, in this case, uh, at standing eye level are open, whereas when you sit down, let's get to a sit down, yes, there we go. When you sit down, um, one is enclosed by built-in cabinetry, and you have an entirely uh, different experience. And again, this, this depends on the position of the eye, the small difference, we would say, from standing to sitting, which makes a huge difference in this house. And I think once the cabinetry is back in, we will get that. And you should always be very uh, cognizant of the eye level that Wright has asked Mr. Furman to shoot these photographs from, because, in fact, the the famous uh, pier cluster shot is not at eye level, or at least not of anyone who's grown up yet, uh, including Wright. This is, this is uh, below four feet, so um, uh, eye level of even the most modestly sized individual would get you over the top of that bookcase and through the glass, and therefore in some cases, as 
Eric and I were discussing, you could see clean through the entire house um, from outside to inside and back outside again. So. <clears throat> um, prospect and refuge, um, the ability to see without being seen, which is the definition of prospect and refuge, um, to allowing us to dwell comfortably in the landscape, are present in every right house, but nowhere more effectively than in the Martin house. And again, uh, until we're finished with the current task, which we are closing in on, I'm going to continue to use these fantastic photographs, which we also do know were often taken under rights, direct uh, sort of, uh, no doubt, light-handed direction. <coughs> Um, the pier cluster, which is in the Furman photograph, and then John Castay, Castay, Casta, Castay. How would you pronounce it? Castay. Yeah, John Castay's beautiful drawing, both taken from uh, roughly seated height. I mean, he's obviously indebted to that photograph and his drawing from seated head height, or maybe slightly higher. Um, for when you stand, you can see right through them. The structural. They have the structure. They have the storage. They have the heating. They have the lighting. They have the ventilation at the edge of the room. They have support for drapes. Um, but more importantly, they spatial, spatially, they structure the space. They are a spatial structure. Um, and with the flying beams, which have no other purpose than to um, define spaces and order their interpenetration. But at, as structure, which they certainly are, what exactly, and I guess this is an uh, issue I will raise in, among a series of others for Richard when he comes to lecture, but what exactly is going on at the base? of this structure. Brick, uh, which of course is the bronzed, as, as I call them, the bronzed uh, seams, the horizontal joints given a kind of sense of light pushing into the brick and questioning, I would say, the density of the brick. Uh, so there's already something at work in this structure in terms of whether we believe it to be real structure or not, especially at night, I would say, when you have firelight and other electrical lights glinting through that and coming probably very, very little off the face of the brick, but quite a lot off of the um, reflective joints between. Um, but as you can see at the top, which is maybe not too unbelievable, we have, we have the, the wooden beams bearing on the um, uh, brick. And at the bottom, what is going on at the bottom? Um, at the bottom, the brick is standing on the wood, and it's not standing behind the wood, it's standing on the wood. In fact, there's a piece of wood that's intentionally exactly the same size as a brick in terms of depth, that, and it is inscribed away exactly as if it were a brick. So the transition is made to this wood base by a wood piece, which an architect immediately has a slight rumbling in the belly when you look at that, because it's not really a happy piece of wood that has this brick apparently resting upon it. And it puts all the rest of the wood, which then you begin to wonder about these slightly splayed legs and whether they're not a sort of sign of some, some compression. Um, and at the top, you begin to notice that he's done some strange reversal. There's a piece of wood that makes a transition between this, the top piece of wood, which again is the size of the brick, and the next piece of the next brick below it is exactly the same size as the joint between the bricks, but it's an Audi, whereas the joints are innies. And so somehow there's sort of a weird transpose, as if it's being squeezed out or something. It's, it's actually quite provocative. And I think if you look also on the beautiful pergola reconstruction, that there are some similar oddities going on in the dialogue, the normal tectonic dialogue between, between the masonry and wood, between the, the stereotomic, as Frampton would call it, and the tectonic. Um, light and the heavy, the load bearing and the load borne, um, there's some odd handoffs going on, um, which uh, again I think are a little evident in many houses, but perhaps more evident in the Martin House. Um, I have talked about the three datum planes that occur in the living room or the unit room or whatever we call this, this uh, wonderful triple space, which is the carpet plan which I have at the top of my diagram which is what's drawn in the furniture plan as well as to some degree in the, in the Bosmuth plan. The door top beams, which are at seven feet uh, above that level, which are the next, the middle diagram. 
So everything that's at that level is darkened in on that drawing. And then the um, actual ceiling itself, which I believe is somewhere around 10 foot 6. Is that about right? 10 foot 6. The main ceiling that runs through. Um, uh, which is, they're all operating, as you can see, in different ways um, to shape our experience. The definition of this woven plan, uh, I believe, is largely uh, to do with this series of horizontal layers that, in fact, uh, in this case, rely on the peer clusters to structure them, but in a certain way, the peer clusters remain open in terms of defining space, and the ceiling is given a tremendous amount of responsibility. One example among so many in the Martin House is the way that the terrace ceiling floats right into the living room, passing miraculously through, originally, uh, a piece of, of uh, leaded glass in excess of 20 feet in length, which uh, does not have any supporting posts uh, coming through it. I think you can see that better in the next shot. Um, um, the terrace doors, as you know if you've been there, stop as you can see in the photos that Eric gave me, um, before they get to that ceiling. So the ceiling is clearly not being held up by those posts. The doors are held up as a kind of frame, and the ceiling floats right clean over the top. Right now, it's kind of held in place by sheets of plexiglass until we get the glass back in. Um, and of course, that's further emphasized by Wright's placement of the skylights, not in the terrace ceiling, but inside the living room, introducing vertical light at the very point where we are beginning to lose the horizontal light that enters from the door. So as you can see from even the photograph in its condition today on the right, there's a sudden heightening of the, of the amount of light you get inside. So there's more light inside than there is outside. Counterintuitive, but um, it works. And if you, know, if you know this space, if you sit in the house, it's a very ambiguous space in a beautiful sense, but the ceiling is relentless as it comes with these straight lines and comes flying right through and, and dies into the large um, lower beam that comes across. Okay, now a little bit of the competition. Um, I would say we could easily spend all of our time on the Martin House, but I do need to cover a few other things. Um, and I would look at three more prairie houses to look at uh, other examples of, um, of the same points. Um, and, and I will just point out the most notable features. I think the comp Perhaps it could be argued that uh, Roby House is the most completely integrated of his prairie houses because it's literally the design is woven into the plan, it's woven into the carpets, it's woven into the window patterns, and um, uh, the, the Roby House performs other duties, that is, I would say, duties that um, more quietly but no less effectively. Um, and these are duties that I think Wright never speaks of but are uh, an important part of our profession, which we now think of as a specialty, which we have no business thinking of as a specialty. The famous cantilevered roof acts to shade the glass from peak summer sun to within a fraction of an inch, if you've been there on July 20th or July 22nd, June 22nd, excuse me, and, um, and uh, suitably astonished uh, Rainer Bannum noticed this in 1969 and announced it to the profession as if no one before him had figured out the sun angles were important. Um, it also does the opposite, that is, it lets the, the winter sun penetrate uh, to warm the concrete floor slab uh, to, to past halfway across the room. Um, which, by the way, is not easy to do with the same, and that's one of, one of the reasons that I argue that that gutter has such an astonishing geometry to it. It's one of the most amazing curves, and it's not so easy to make, that curve. One of the reasons is that it needs to reach out far enough to shade that summer sun, but to cut back fast enough to let the winter sun slide as deep as possible into the Roby house, because in fact the long front, uh, the famous long front faces um, uh, south. Now, um, these practical aspects, that is keeping us warm or cool as the case may be, including the section's uh, sub subtle provision of both protection from views in uh, that is refuge and, and uh, generous views out, prospect, that is people can't see you but you can see out to see them. It was never specifically mentioned by Wright, only the poetic um, ideas um, in his opinion were worth mentioning. I think that's because in his time, unlike in ours, if you didn't do the practical things correctly, if the houses didn't function in terms of energy use 
and general sort of uh, logic of environmental um, sustainability, as we call it today, then you just didn't get another job. But that, that wasn't going to be what got you the great jobs, which is the, is the quality of the space in the house. Woefully in need of its furniture. Um, the Coonley House, which Wright often talked about being his favorite prairie house, which you have to be careful with words like that. But the site plans local symmetries, um, yet overall informality. Public and private rooms on the same level, so that the, in this case, unlike many other houses, so that the living room has an open glazed uh, corners. Because usually, like in the Barton house, the living room or the lower public rooms have the closed corners, even though he talked a lot about breaking the box. Whereas the rooms upstairs, the private rooms on the second floor, have the open glass corners. But in this case, because they're both on the same floor, the living room does have the open glass corners. Of course, the entire house is lifted up to the second level, the main space of the house. Um, I think one of the reasons that Wright was fond of this house is because of Ferry Coonley's um, statement that the house bore the countenance of principle, which is a very good bon mot that I'm sure he wished he'd thought up, which he then, he then took on himself. It also fuses the two extremes of dwelling that he had uh, talked about, which is the cave and the tent, with particular effectiveness. Um, our movement through the spaces, the daily ritual of uh, procession from living to dining room, the focus of Wright's structured photography, and I'm also matching that with the drawings that he later made from those photographs, um, the Furman photographs. Um, the furniture and carpet in these photographs is worth a, an entire treatise in exactly how he positions them because they're generally in positions that they could not be used and yet they stand in for a certain kind of human movement through the space, uh, sort of record. One sees carpets sliding across spaces in the distance that suggest cross paths, which in fact do exist in those rooms. And there's a more contemporary photograph of, of that sequence from the living room to the dining room. And finally, for the Prairie Houses, the May House in Grand Rapids, Michigan of 1908 plan is not as closely related, perhaps, to the Ladies' Home Journal plans, but it is quite similar to the Heath House here in Buffalo, among others. You have a compressed entry sequence that twists and turns, climbing. You know, the eye always sees uh, before the body can occupy. And if you look at the, the plan in the upper, and you're coming in from the top, you see how you twist and turn, which is this whole sequence of movement in the upper right photograph. And you see through, again, the slats, but you physically can't go there. You have to take a turn, go up some stairs, take another turn, come back around, and eventually re-establish uh, that viewpoint, um, but at that point you're of course more interested in certain things happening to the side, like this, the dining room that draws you in. Um, and I think one of the things that this, which has been reconstructed by the Steelcase Corporation, um, which is uh, the reconstruction of this house was this use, in this case, of something perhaps more, it only happens in the fireplace as far as I can tell, and it's um, which is the only place that masonry is exposed inside this house, so it's very different from the Martin house. But the use in this case of, 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 uh, of a mosaic tile of glass, a glass gold a mosaic, uh, which is of course much brighter, almost like a mirror, um, but you can see the effects uh, that it has coming out of the joints and how to some degree it questions the compaction and the standing of the brick on top of each other. It's sliced open with light. Um, and again, at night, I suspect this would be heightened because you'd get the flickering of the electric lights and the, and the, f the flames from the fire. Okay, now we spent most time on the prairie, so these others will go quicker, I assure you. Um, the second principle that was at operation throughout his career um, is, uh, has to do with how space is ordered through the manner in which it is built, the way it is constructed. How this order of construction is determined by his search for what he called the nature of materials, and how he achieved a coherent tectonic order that encompassed both composition and construction. And this attribute of Wright's work can be said to dominate, I would argue, the concrete blockhouses particularly, begun in the early 1920s and continuing to the end of his career, and I show uh, the Millard House La Miniatura and Pasadena of 1923 and the Tonkin's House of 1954. 
a late concrete block house. And just as uh, two examples of this, the Freeman House in Los Angeles, 1923, Wright uses, in this case, a square gridded paper to draw both the plan and the section, and those grid, grids are set at 16 inches on center, so they are the size of the, of the block he's using. Um, uh, the anchored uh, refuge of the living room at the hearth and the open but glazed corners, the butt glazed corners, which is I think his first use of that at the, at the corners. So there's a total dynamic between this kind of anchored um, space, which is the, the ultimate refuge, and this incredible prospect, which is still pretty spectacular today, though there's a few other things that cropped up into it. Um, glass is also cast into the blocks, which is a sort of further questioning of the solidity and the density of the, of the concrete block as a kind of cast stone, if it can also somehow have miraculously light in it, um, which defies their you know, weight and solidity. And I would say in a, it operates in a similar way to the gold or bronze that he presses into the joints of the brick in the Martin House and the other prairie houses. The Tonkins House in Amberley Village, Ohio, 1954, uh, has, uh, as many of his later block houses, cast block walls and ceiling roof with the floor slab, of course, concrete now, with the grid scored into the floor so that the whole house is um, basically organized um, on the grid, no construction lines needed. Um, and again, in this case, even to a greater degree, the concrete block becomes the source of the light. But the square grid, which he often called the unit system, um, was something that he'd been using both as a matter of construction control, that is, he doesn't need to have dimensions on his floor plans, um, and he doesn't need to dimension material pieces, um, and the aesthetic order, which I would say falls under the sort of notion that, that Whitman had when he talked about chanting the square deific. Um, it's the practical and the poetic are perfectly combined in this case, in his um, uh, the gridded paper on which the Forable students recorded in the upper right, their block placements, illustrated grid patterns. That's from a teacher's textbook. Wright, of course, was exposed to this sort of late according to the rules of the game, but perhaps more important was his re-exposure, which he used when he used these textbooks himself in the late 1890s in teaching his own kids the Forable system and playing with them in the afternoons. Um, it's interesting that 1896, he developed uh, with a similar gridded pattern the Luxfor Prism Company block patterns, which were patented, and the patents are still in existence. And then, of course, Otto Graf, my friend, has uh, analyzed these, and it reveals not only the grid, but in fact many other fundamental geometries. On the left is the Walter Gertz Cottage, Whitehall, Michigan, 1902, which is one of the classic board and batten houses. And it has a vertical grid based on the materials. Um, in this case, the one, one foot deep boards. Um, and it has a horizontal grid based on the four by four um, grid of the posts. Um, and on the lower right, the quadruple block house plan developed in the same time as the ladies' home journal houses in 1901 through three. Now, all of these use the square grid at different uh, nested scales. And I'll come back to a couple of these. Again, just to remind you of the way that he sort of systematized this when the block houses came along, like the grid paper that's used here in these drawings. Um, perhaps more interesting is the, is the so-called first block house, the Frank Brown project uh, that you can see his notation, his later notation from the 50s, calling it the first block house. Um, it was uh, designed in the same year that Wright was working in uh, 1906. He was actually starting in on construction of Unity Temple, which was the first uh, concrete cast building that he worked on. And during the, uh, his later writing about um, Unity Temple and that experience, he does criticize cast concrete for the fact that it doesn't reveal all of its rhythms. That is, the rhythms of the hidden steel bars can't be exposed. One, one, one is presented with, as you can see in the construction and the final product, a kind of massive but somewhat mute uh, expression uh, of, in fact, what's a quite complex woven system that's inside that's allowing it to work, so the weaving of the steel. Um, so it is of interest to me that even though this project was not built, uh, it's quite clear that the Brown House, which I have the 
the perspective and the, and the elevation of was uh, a fairly well worked out concrete block system using concrete slabs uh, for, this, for the roofs and the floors and then um, uh, some kind of custom made block of two different sizes, the narrow and the wide, uh, in different combinations is developed um, in the same year that Unity Temple is in construction. And for various reasons, he was not able to realize that, of course, until 1923. So for 17 years, this idea lay a bit dormant in his mind. Um, these are two buildings I like to compare. This is the Fireproof House for $5,000, which is the Ladies' Home Journal House of 1905. Um, and that was part of the impetus for his development of the Brown House as a concrete block house was the notion that concrete construction and its fireproof um, nature was of great interest around the country at that time. And um, that plan, which is in the lower left, is an evolution of uh, the four square plan and Frank Wood Wright's house in some ways. And then of course, uh, this was not a plan that he forgot about. And this is a 1949 so-called Usonian automatic made with the cast blocks, um, which has almost the exact same plan, slightly larger. <laughs> Um, and a, and a ex, you know, reasonably similar massing and expression and overhang, etc. On the uh, upper left is the prototype concrete textile blockhouse of 1921, which uh, was drawn on a tartan grid, which is interesting, ABA grid, that is like the Martin House rather than a, a strict straight grid. And then I just juxtaposed that with the Como Orchards summer colony, board and batten, plans and elevations of 1908, uh, which has almost the same plan and is also on a square grid for the same reasons, though that's wood construction. I just to finish up with the Storer House, which is one of the great examples of the block house. And of course, the plan of the store is closely related to prairie houses. And he referred to these houses collectively in the 20s as the that is the, the textile block houses, textile block, not cast concrete block. And in 1923, he characterized himself, the architect, not as a sculptor, but as a weaver. So he calls himself the weaver in 1923. Okay. Final category of ordering principles which is perhaps what he's most famous for, but I would, uh, I, I'm not sure that it's uh, the most dominant because, again, I think these operate in coexistence and sort of in a penetrate, which has to do with um, how space is ordered in order to establish a relationship with the landscape. How right designed houses where the landscape, interior space, and construction material are woven together to become a setting for the repeated rituals of daily life, and how Wright, throughout his career, endeavored to give order to the developing American suburb. So daily life was to take place in conjunction with light and uh, nature. And these are thought to have reached a sort of high point in the Usonian houses, which were begun in the 1930s and continued until the end of his career. And I show photographs of the Pope House, but also the parallel and, and closely related falling water of 1935. The first I, I think the first true Usonian is the Jacobs House. It has the L-shaped plan, which is asymmetrical. There's hardly a hint of symmetry left here. And it's pushed to one corner of the site. The site plan, in this case, is, is the key document. Leaving the center of the site for the garden. Two perspectives in the lower right are extremely important to understanding what Wright's up, up to do. And I would say this is that we live in a time when one makes drawings with the touch of a switch or with a punch of a key. And uh, we, uh, you know, I have to sort of convince my students that, it, that perhaps 50 drawings are not as important as one that's a little more thoughtful. Um, and architects, I don't have such influence over, so uh, I just have to watch in dismay. But um, these two drawings took a while, and they're very carefully set up, and Wright always has a very clear intention. And the uh, two perspectives are drawn on the sheet together. And uh, one is above the other, denoting importance. Um, also has to do with eye levels. The plan below, I've always been intrigued by whether these could be actually cast from the same vanishing point. But uh, the plan below is a view from the street side. We are above the house. We are outside the house. We can see the house as a complete object. 
it, it is an object for us to view and we are disembodied, that is we are floating at some point somewhere around 30 feet off the ground to get this view. So we have been taken off the earth and put into a kind of completely disembodied position. I juxtapose that to the upper and supposedly more important, though smaller drawing, which is from the garden side where if you look, the pieces of the house actually go off each edge of the drawing. So in fact, I can't see the whole house and all the walls that are associated with it. I can only see this sort of unfurling skin. I'm looking into a very open, I mean, everything is open here as opposed to being closed below. And most importantly, I'm on the ground and I'm inside the house. It's opening up like that to me as opposed to coming at me like this. And so I'm inside the house. So basically this is the central room of the house, this garden. And it could not be more clear about the intentions of the Usonian houses. <clears throat> and these are views of that house um, you know, from similar vantage points, though I'm not floating 30 feet above the ground. Um, there are other things going on here which are uh, of interest and which I think do relate to uh, what comes out of the um, prairie houses, and that includes particularly the way he uses the ceiling, as you see here, as it directs you in as you move in along the, the uh, entry axis on the on the left. I don't know, that's the dining room, that's from the kitchen, sorry. Um, uh, you can see the entry axis coming there on the upper photograph from the left, and then as you get into the living room, the boards in the ceiling turn and go to the right in this case, which is out the glass doors and into the garden. So there's a clear use of the ceiling again as opposed to the neutral floor grid, which is just a, a red concrete with the square grid um, carved into it. The ceiling is more articulate, gives us subtle hints about where to go, the lights that lead you back into the dining area from the living area, for instance. Another example would be the Carlson House, uh, late house 1950 from Phoenix, which is, in my opinion, almost Japanese. Uses a four by four inch posts and beams with a four foot grid and cement board panels in between. Has a rather fantastic submerged kitchen, which you can see in this lower drawing that actually, so when you're standing in the kitchen and sitting in the dining room, your head just pops above the ground, which is nice in Arizona where it's hot and you, you're sitting in the shade uh, below ground. Um, and again, um, a, an almost return, I think, in some cases, in some of these last Usonians, back to the spirit of the prairie house, the simplest prairie houses. Okay, so where did this come from? Um, I'm showing the Vosmuth drawing of the garden plan of the William Martin House of 1902 to 4, which is one of the critical um, projects for making the connection between Wright and the Martin family. Um, if you endeavor to follow this, which no longer exists, this plan, though, as you can see on the right, with Wright's funny photo, I intentionally photographed this with a caption, the garden facade, that's what it says. So the house, you can't see the house. The house doesn't exist, you see the garden facade. That's because you enter by coming in on the lower right corner and me meandering your way through this garden to find your way to the front door, uh, which is at the end of the longest projection of house, which you can just sort of see in the one of these views, but you're obviously coming through a rather bit of a jungle, and you, you have to do a tremendous amount of movement. What's also interesting about this plan is look what's happened to the house. There's, this is the neighboring lot on the left, and this house has been jammed hard up against that edge. And in fact, it's no longer, it's, it's, maybe it's close to the Heath house, maybe, but I mean, it's, it's, the plan is just a jumble. It has nothing to do with the prairie, the, the Ladies Home Journal houses. This is a plan that's been subjected to a tremendous amount of compression from the idea of pushing it off the center. So in fact, there's no enclosed space. There's no glazed spaces in the center of the site at all. If you draw a line right to the center of the site, you end up in the pergola. I will use this at this point. So, well, maybe not. Always good to have a second one. Um, so, for the site, here, which of course is part of the entry sequence, but you get to it by meandering your way and various possibilities to come into there. That's not so exceptional. Um, we also have, in this case, the Frick House, uh, Oak Park, 1901-02, 
in which case the house, um, which is in the two larger drawings, is again pushed in this case straight to the, to the sidewalk because there's a neighboring street. And in fact, there is an open air pavilion which sits in the middle of the site and shares the middle of the site with a large specimen oak tree, which is no longer there, unfortunately. And neither is the pavilion because a house was put between this house and the next house. But the plan, as you can see in the um, upper right, is again compressed hard up against, this is almost a Roby House plan with the sort of service bar up against the street and then the sort of important rooms towards the garden, but not in the garden because in fact the, the gazebo-like space gets there. And I just wanted to point out that the earliest that I know of drawing of anything to do with the Martin House is this little sketch from the letter that Wright wrote to Martin, um, which shows almost the same plan as the Frick House, that is a house pushed hard against the left-hand site edge and then a actual gazebo with an arm on it that's growing out of the... So it's a very similar notion that he started with on the Martin House of this. Of course, it, it became, um, as we know, more unified, but that, and it almost looks like it's glued on. Again, the center of the site, if you draw a, a line through that open space of the site here in Buffalo, would, would uh, correspond with the location of the open-air gazebo, which was, of course, later transformed into the, into the terrace. Uh, there are other examples of this same thing. The uh, Little House in Peoria, Illinois, in the upper left, um, which has the entry right in the middle between the house. The entry pavilion is moved forward in order to enter the, intersect the entry access. And then again, there's an open air gazebo that actually occupies the sort of prime part of the site. The rest of the house is pushed hard up against the neighbor's house, in this case, to the top. The Ullman House, which is here uh, lower left, is actually entered right at the center of the site, but it's entered into the part of the house that, again, has been pushed hard up against the sidewalk. And the um, dining room is actually treated as if it were almost a garden pavilion that sits out right in the middle with a fountain on one side and a flower garden, a formal flower garden on the other as a kind of gazebo. And then the porter house, the second scheme for the porter house, which is, um, Again, a house packed into a bar out of which, in this case, a tall wall is projected to frame a generous um, landscape, an outdoor room that spills out, as you can see, and takes up the majority of the plan, the lower plan. I always like this. Now, these are all, some of these plans are from the so-called, you know, lost years, but there's a lot of work going on in the lost years. This is the Schroeder House of Milwaukee, 1911, uh, not realized, upper two drawings. And um, I particularly like the site plan. Now the, now the grid is, you know, I mean, he must have liked this grid, but this is actually surveying points. So he's, he's, he's had the surveyor lay it out. The lake is to the top, the entry is to the bottom. There's an axis that goes through. It looks as if it's two buildings, which you can see from the drawing in the upper right, it's actually one. But, but in fact, there is a passage, not unlike some parts of the Coonley House, where you can drive around and come back around. There's a sort of formal garden that runs up this side of the site, ends in this rather uh, sort of amazing sort of exedra at the end. And then there's this oddly shaped piece that's sort of tossed off into the field on the right. But it turns out if you look at the plans um, and also the, you can see it from the uh, perspective, the main part of the house is actually in the field, in the undeveloped free grass field that has this relationship to the field and to the lake. And in fact, it's all the service elements of the house that are placed in this formal garden and locked into the geometry of the formal garden. And uh, if you look at the plan and the way it relates to the garden, this garden that kind of shoots out of the house, I would argue this is a direct precursor for the Lloyd Lewis house, which many people love this drawing in the lower right, but they don't realize until they go see the house that he did build the gardens that way. They do come out of it from underneath the house in a series of rows. So you can come right out from the house sort of hoeing away. And uh, in, in the time when it was built, kind of an important activity, I think. Um, <clears throat> the lower left is the Gertz House of Glencoe, Illinois, 1906. Again, the house is pushed hard up against one edge of the site. Main rooms sit out into the more open field. In this case, uh, an enormously long wall dividing the entire site, which has the front is a field and the back is a garden. And if you would try to describe this plan, it would be L-shaped or even a Z-shaped house. And then, of course, the very early Thomas House in the upper right, 1901, which is an L-shaped plan with dining and living rooms opening to the side to the central terrace. That is, they don't operate axially. They're now turning and opening to the side onto this large terrace. And in this case, the 
The kitchen is also the hinge, and I think here is really the early Jacob's plan, 33 years before the fact, uh, with the exception, of course, that the bedrooms are not at the end of the second leg, but they're on the second floor. The Allen House of Wichita, Kansas on the, on the left, and then on the right, the Mendelssohn House in Albany, New York of 1912. It was 1916 and 1912 during the lost years. L-shaped plans which wrap around, in this case, walled gardens. And we should remember that one of the early plans for the uh, Usonians, unrealized, was the Lusk House, which was, uh, uh, in fact, showed an entire walled garden, um, as well as the L-shaped house, the same plan as the, as the um, Jacob's house. And the living room doors open again to the side, not axially, but to the side, through the terrace doors into the garden. Um, the Coonley House of 1908 in the upper right and Taliesin of 1911, this plan. Um, L-shaped or almost C-shaped plans that focus on the garden as the center of the composition of domestic spaces. Basically one-story plans with living and sleeping spaces all on one level. The Cutton House, Downers Grove, Illinois of 1911, which is a prairie house that has been nearly pulled apart to frame several garden spaces. Interior rooms serving as kind of garden pavilions, almost as if every room is now a garden pavilion. And then I want to come back and remind you that it was the plan, this plan, this redrafted, perfected, woven plan that was put onto the loom that Wright hung in his studio at Taliesin for 50 years after the house was completed. Because for him it represented a kind of perfection, not the actual house plan, but the site plan drawn this way. Um, it is really all, I think it's not really all that surprising then to find that we can in fact with sort of clever manipulations construct close approximations of the asymmetrical Usonian house plans from this plan by using sort of selective clippings and reorientations. The Martin House, given this pride of place in the studio wall, must be understood as the source in every possible way of Wright's later work. Four examples, which I'm not sure I will label them all, but they all, 1911 through 1921, all of them showing the, the sort of emergence of the L-shaped plan during the Prairie period. Um, then I just want to touch on the urban ideas because I think this was tied in. This is the quadruple block plan as it was evolved for Charles Roberts in 1903, but it actually was part of the original presentation of one of the two Ladies Home Journal, uh, Home in the Prairie Town of 1900, well, it was done in 1900 and then published in 1901. Um, and I think it's unfolded here with all of its sort of possible permutations. Um, there are variations that include pinwheeling the houses around each other, uh, various kinds of symmetrical and mirror images, um, sometimes involving um, a sharing of uh, a garage or uh, stables at the center. I mean, this is actually originally evolved before there were cars to speak of, but it actually accommodates uh, separation of pedestrian and vehicular traffic quite, quite well. Um, the quadruple block plan, which is the small plan in the upper one, led directly to the Chicago City Club competition for a new urban quarter in 1913 on the left-hand side, which then I would argue leads directly to Broadacre City, 1932. The 1913 proposal presages every significant aspect of the so-called new urbanism, I might mention. Walkable community, mixed housing, commercial parks and civic um, apartments and single-family dwellings, I would say, which are not true of TNU, and neither is access to mass transit, both of which these have. Um, it's the basic fabric of the proposal, as you can see in the upper left. These little tiny dots are the quadruple blocks uh, of houses sort of spinning around each other. And in fact, uh, I think it can be shown fairly definitively that the Broadacre City is just an expanded version of that, where in fact this, the lot sizes grow significantly, and to some degree the geometry of the individual houses is sacrificed. In the same way, I'm wrapping up here, in the same way that the prairie houses presaged more, I would argue, in the stables of the Willett Winslow House of 1893, which is drawn at the top of that sheet, than in the main house itself. The Usonian house is presaged by this little cottage, which is shown in the rest of the drawings, right down to the wall section with its horizontal boards inside and out. This is the summer cottage for Sherman Booth, 1911. The construction language of the Usonians is here already completely in place. And I've I've taken the wall section, rotated it, and enlarged it so you could have a look at it. 
And the only thing that is different from this, from the final Usonians, is this substitution in the Usonians of the, of the concrete block floor, I mean the concrete cast floor for the, in this case, um, typical wooden joist floor. And uh, the Erdman prefabricated houses, I think, are worth having a look at from 1950 to 59. Another type of design that Wright is generally never credited with, the low cost but high quality prefabricated houses, something which he worked on almost nonstop in one way or another from 1917 onwards. And interestingly, both of these versions, which apparently the one on the right he was working on very late, if not the last thing he worked on before he died, um, they are all based, again, if you look closely, on the four square Wright house precedent. And so even at this late date, when it comes to building a sort of tight, efficient house, he goes back to his own house. And I'm going to end with the Penfield House in Willoughby Fields, Ohio, 1952. A plan which has 8 to 12 foot ceilings for his 6 foot 6 client. Shows only four masonry anchors at the ends. You can see the plan. The kind of a loose fabric is then wrapped around it that allows light and the landscape to flow into the house and right through the space. The main space closes and protects uh, towards the fireplace, right hand view, and then opens and extends towards the forest in the opposite direction. Um, if one looks for ordering principles rather than formal shapes, there is nothing in this beautiful house that cannot be traced back in its origin to the prairie houses. Um, in conclusion, briefly, writes three primary ordering principles, initial that is the initial conception of interior spatial experience, that is, that that's the first starting point. Fusion of composition and construction into one. And the ethical imperative that daily life takes place in close association with sunlight and nature, all originated in the prairie houses. And Wright's prairie house woven plan, I would argue, was itself the inspiration for the great modern discoveries in plan making, which we're all still using today. Thank you very much.